with that, um, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker this week, uh, Professor Drew Higgins from the Department of uh, Chemical Engineering, and he'll be giving the first of, of three lectures that are in the theme of sort of materials for energy applications. Uh, Drew received his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the University of Waterloo in 2009, and then he pursued both master's and PhD studies at the University of Waterloo in chemical engineering under the supervision of uh, Zhang Wei Chen, uh, where he worked on catalysis for fuel cells and metal ion uh, batteries. He completed his PhD in 2015, uh, and then took on a Banting postdoctoral fellowship, a very prestigious uh, award. Um, and he took that to Stanford University, where he worked with Thomas Jeremillo on uh, CO2 reduction catalysis. Uh, he uh, was a postdoc for a couple of years and then became sort of an associate staff scientist at Stanford in 2017. Uh, did that for a couple of years, and then we were very fortunate to. Um, recruit him to McMaster in 2019 when he started as an assistant professor. And since coming to uh, McMaster, he has started up a really exciting research program, uh, developing catalysts for things like electro electrochemical CO2 reduction, water splitting, and fuel cells. Um, he had the unenviable experience of having to, you know, uh, deal with a pandemic uh, right at the beginning of his career. I think we've had a number of starting faculty uh, doing this and, and managing really impressively. He has published, it uh, looks like 16 papers in the last two years over the course of the pandemic. So that's uh, pretty amazing. And I think he's got a really nice trajectory for his future career. So with that, uh, I'll turn the floor over to Drew and we look forward to your seminar. Awesome, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alex, for that. That very nice introduction. And I should say, I feel fortunate that I was uh, offered a position at McMaster and I've thoroughly enjoyed it so far. And um, we've built up a, a nice research program. I feel lucky also that um, we had about a, a year and three months head start um, before the pandemic to get the lab operating and running. And uh, honestly, the students have done the brunt of the work in terms of maintaining the lab and keeping the research going. So all the credit goes to them. I've been sitting at home um, most of this time. Um, and Florian, thank you so much also for all the all the work you did putting together the, the seminars and coordinating everything. Um, Technology-wise, can you all hear me, see me, see the screen? All's good? Excellent. Okay. Um, so today, what I'm going to be talking about is I'm going to be talking about the development and understanding of catalyst for the electrochemical conversion of CO2 into fuels and chemicals. And as Alex mentioned, I spent a few years at Stanford University, which kind of the first half or so of this talk is going to cover some of that work. And the second half is going to cover some work that we're doing here at McMaster University. I kind of stitched them together to hopefully put together a somewhat cohesive story as opposed to jumping all over the place. Now, just a little motivation for uh, for why we do our research. Hopefully there's no one here, and maybe there's one or two of you, but generally don't need to convince anyone that climate change is real, climate change is an issue. The increasing CO2 emissions we're seeing in the world are causing a lot of problems in terms of droughts, fires, floods, you name it. We're seeing, we're seeing the implications of climate change. And that's because of when we look at our energy portfolio, at any given moment, we're consuming about 18 terawatts of energy. This is probably a little bit higher now. This, this figure might be a little bit outdated, but 85% of that comes from fossil fuel sources that have associated CO2 emissions. If we continue on this trajectory, it's estimated that we're gonna see global temperature increases of about five degrees Celsius. As of now, we've seen about one degree Celsius increase since the pre-industrial times. And we're already seeing the significant consequences of that. I can't even imagine what, what kind of devastating consequences would happen if we got to this five degrees Celsius mark. 
So really, I look at it as the job of scientists and the job of engineers to develop new processes, new technologies to get us on this relatively safe trajectory where we have sustainable routes to produce the fuels, chemicals, fertilizers that society depends upon without having associated CO2 emissions. So this is just the image uh, of you know what a, that that I share with many of my colleagues of what a future sustainable energy infrastructure may look like, and I'll just highlight a couple of features of it. This is this is a, a somewhat simplified vision of what a, a future sustainable energy economy may look like. Obviously, it's it's very complicated. And different areas across the world have different needs. But at the basic level, we want to be able to rely on renewable sources of electricity, things like wind, things like solar, things like hydro. And, you know, as a society, we still are going to require for, for the near future um, fuels, chemicals and fertilizers. So being able to use electricity to, to produce those and ideally the feedstocks for producing those fuels, chemicals, and fertilizers can be molecules that are readily abundant to us. So molecules such as nitrogen, such as CO2, such as water, such as oxygen, if we can use these molecules and renewable sources of electricity to produce the fuels, chemicals, and fertilizers that we require as a society, that's how we can get towards sustainability. And so at the basic level, if we want to drive these conversions between, uh, between electrical energy and chemical energy, we're going to need catalysts or more specifically electrocatalysts and that's largely what I'm going to be talking about today and mostly I'm going to be talking about the electrochemical conversion of carbon dioxide into fuels and into chemicals. So I'm going to be talking about developing catalysts for this electrochemical reaction and then understanding these catalysts so that we can use that to inform new designs in the future. Before I get too deep into that topic, I just want to highlight that, you know, that's not the only thing we're working on. We're working on various, what I would call sustainable electrochemical energy conversion and storage technologies. And so we have one project uh, developing supercapacitors, which are kind of like a battery, a high power density battery that charges and discharges in a matter of seconds. We have uh, that project's in collaboration with an automotive company that is interested in supercapacitors for their electric vehicles. We have a few projects in terms of electrochemical CO2 conversion that I'm going to be talking about a little bit today. We're also working with a company based uh, just outside of Halifax, developing rechargeable zinc ion batteries that are being targeted for grid scale energy storage applications. We have a few other projects where we're trying to use electricity to uh, convert chemicals into more valuable chemicals. So for example, um, taking oxygen and converting it to hydrogen peroxide, that is a, a disinfection agent that could be used for water treatment, for example. And then a big thrust in our group, and I'm going to touch on this a little bit as well, is uh, the characterization and understanding of catalysts using what are called in situ or operando approaches. So essentially characterizing the structure and properties of materials under reaction conditions, which will give us insight into how they perform that can then be used to guide new and improved designs. So let's just take a step back here and, and refresh our memories of what exactly a catalyst is. So at the basic level, a catalyst is a material that accelerates the rate of a chemical reaction without being consumed in the process. And there are a few requirements of a good catalyst, some properties that we want for catalysts that are going to be implemented out into the world. One of them is activity or how fast that catalyst can make the chemical reaction go. Another one is selectivity. A lot of chemical reactions can go down different pathways, forming just a wide array of products. And if you, if you make a ton of different products all within one mixture, you're gonna end up with a separations problem on your hand. Separations can be energy intensive, they're very costly. So ideally we want a catalyst that's selective to that, that most desirable product or products that we wanna be able to, to sell for commercial value and profit or use to address the needs of society. Then we want catalysts that are stable, that operate for thousands and thousands of hours without degrading. And then ultimately economics drives everything. We need materials that are low cost. Catalysts that are low cost in terms of the, the materials that go into them and in terms of the, the preparation of those catalysts. 
Taking this one step further, an electrocatalyst is a catalyst used for an electrochemical reaction or a reaction that involves the, the transfer of an electron. And we can look at electrocatalysts, for example, in reactions that involve the conversion of electrical energy into chemical energy or using electricity to create fuels. Those processes are going to need some sort of electrocatalyst. And on the right here, I show an electrochemical device, for example, that could use renewable sources of electricity like, like wind or solar to convert carbon dioxide into valuable chemicals. The two I show here are ethylene and ethanol. But when you, when you zoom into what this device looks like, at those electrodes that are facilitating those, those electrochemical conversions, we need nanostructured catalysts that have all those properties I outlined on the last slide, the activity, the selectivity, the stability, and the low cost. So that's really where uh, a lot of the work that, that my team's doing and people we collaborate with are, are developing those catalysts that can perform these reactions very selectively, very actively at a low cost. So for example, I'm gonna be talking about electrochemical CO2 conversion today. And just in case, you know, that's a, a lot of words and we're not quite clear what that means. I just wanna show an example of an electrochemical reaction here where, for example, we have CO2 molecules that undergo a series of proton and electron transfers, ultimately being reduced into something like ethylene or into something like methane or something like ethanol or something like carbon monoxide that I'm going to be talking about a little bit today. This is what the mechanism of a, or the, I should say, like the, the reaction, uh, an electrochemical reaction looks like. This is the, and this is the framework that our research group operates. And, you know, a lot of research groups across the world operate like this, where essentially what we do is, you know, we, we're, we think about a electrochemical reaction where the catalyst is a limiting factor, whether it's the activity or selectivity, stability. And then we, we use our chemical intuition, we survey the literature to come up with ideas for new catalyst designs that will hopefully provide us with enhanced activity, enhanced stability, enhanced performance in general. We take this knowledge, we go into the lab, we try to synthesize these materials, then we characterize these materials to understand what their structures and what their properties look like. And then we test these materials for their activity, their selectivity and their stability. Generally, the first time we try this, you know, th sometimes things go okay, sometimes the materials we make are not great, sometimes, you know, they're they're so-so, um, but we can use that as a learning experience. And so what we do is we take the, the performance evaluation data that we've collected and we correlate that with the results of our materials characterization to arrive at what we call performance descriptors or properties of a catalyst that make it good. If we can identify what these performance descriptors are, we can feed that back into new material designs to hopefully develop something that performs better than anything we've seen before. And then ultimately what we do, we, we iteratively apply this feedback loop, hopefully arriving at a catalyst or a material that performs better than anything we've ever seen before. And then we can integrate that into a end device like a battery or an ele electrolyzer or a fuel cell to demonstrate its performance under, under re more realistic conditions. In terms of electrochemical CO2 conversion technologies, um, you know, there's a lot of talk out there about CO2 capture from the atmosphere and then conversion into fuels and chemicals. I think that's still a little ways away, you know, separating 420 ppm of CO2 from the atmosphere and then in a way that's energetically efficient and low cost is difficult. But the, the nice thing is, I, I wouldn't say it's a nice thing, but um, in terms of this technology, we do have lots of point sources of CO2 available that could be a nice entry point for a technology of this nature. For example, if you're the odd university student that likes a beer or a glass of wine, um, distilleries and breweries are point sources of, of concentrated CO2 emissions. Uh, cement manufacturing is a big one. Heating up the calcium carbonate to calcium oxide reduces we uh, emits CO2 in the process. And then there's lots of fuel processing facilities, industrial processes, refineries, steel making, et cetera, that are, could be point sources of CO2 emissions and could be a nice entry point for this technology. So this all sounds great. 
you know, this all seems promising, but what is the holdup? And this is a little bit of a simplified picture of what the holdup may be. But really, there's two things that are plaguing the development of this technology or the implementation of this technology. The first is the cost of the electricity used to, to drive this conversion. The nice thing is, is that we've seen dramatic decreases in the cost of renewable electricity over recent years to the point that in some areas of the world, we're down to two, three, four cents per kilowatt hour for renewable sources of electricity. And hopefully that continues to go down as we move forward. And then the second thing, and this is where the research that my team and many others across the world are focusing on, is we need to increase the energy conversion efficiency or the efficiency for taking that electrical energy and converting it into chemical energy in the form of fuels or chemicals. So that's where a lot of the catalyst development efforts are focused on producing catalysts that are more active, more efficient, and then integrating them into end devices to achieve an overall higher energy conversion efficiency, getting us to that point, the point where these electrochemical processes can be competitive with conventional processes for producing these fuels and chemicals. But there are some challenges. The first challenge is the lack of available catalysts for converting CO2 into fuels and chemicals. And I show here the, a periodic table that just summarizes what the different metals do in terms of CO2 reduction catalysis. And you'll see that, you know, hydrogen is on there. And that's strange because, you know, how do you convert CO2 into hydrogen? But the problem is when you're doing CO2, electrochemical CO2 conversion processes, you also have water there. And some catalysts, some metals are very good at converting water into hydrogen, which is great for some applications, for example, water electrolysis. But when we're aiming to convert CO2 into fuels and chemicals, if those electrons are being stolen to form hydrogen, that's a competing process and that's going to lower the efficiency of the, of the process that we're targeting. There are a few metals that can be very selective for the conversion of carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide. But the two most active metals for that process, and whereby carbon monoxide is a very valuable, well, is a very important chemical intermediate, the two best metals for facilitating that conversion are silver and gold, which obviously come with uh, quite the price tag. Just a few catalysts, other metals that can produce formic acid fairly selectively from CO2, which is great. Formic acid has a little bit of a, of a smaller market size, so maybe the impacts uh, of going towards formic acid are not as high as we'd want them to be until maybe in the future formic acid uh, fuel cell technologies take off. And then in terms of producing for what we call further reduced products or products that take more than two electrons transferred to CO2 to produce things like hydrocarbons like ethylene or methane and things like alcohols, let's say like isopropanol, ethanol, there's really only one metal, one type of catalyst that can do those conversion processes, and that's copper. So really, we don't have a whole lot of availability in terms of catalysts that are available. And a lot of the ones that are available come with a bit of a price tag or with some limitations. Then if we do want to talk about the catalysts we have available, activity is a little bit of a, of a challenge. And so I show here a scale of electrochemical potential. Essentially, you can look at going further down this, this scale of having to put more energy into that system to drive this electrochemical reaction. So if we want to think about the conversion of carbon dioxide into ethylene, for example, at any electrochemical potential below 0.08 volts versus the reversible hydrogen electrode, at any potential below that value, thermodynamically, we are able to convert CO2 into ethylene. But in reality, when we put a catalyst into, uh, into an electrochemical reactor and run this reaction, we don't see ethylene showing up until about a potential that's about 800 millivolts lower than that. That means that we're losing 800 millivolts of energy every single time we want to convert two CO2 molecules into ethylene. So right there, we're taking a huge efficiency hit. Then the last thing I'd like to quickly highlight is selectivity. So I mentioned below 0 0.08 volts versus the RHE that CO2 can thermodynamically be reduced into ethylene, but we generally don't see that until about minus 0.8 volts versus the RHE. All of there, there's a bunch of other electrochemical CO2 reduction reactions that can occur under those same 
under those same potential conditions. So thermodynamically, we can produce things like ethylene, we can produce methanol, we can produce formic acid, we can produce carbon monoxide. We can produce about 10 to 12 additional other products under those conditions from a thermodynamic standpoint. And it turns out that something like copper does produce all of those. So once again, what we end up with is we end up with a, with a selectivity or a separations problem on our hand. So we want catalysts that are selective to just one or maybe two of these most desirable products. Now, in terms of the products that can be formed, um, most of them on, on copper, uh, in terms of some of the further reduced products, some of these are, are very valuable chemicals that are widely used. For example, let's talk about ethanol that could be used as a, if it's produced from a renewable electricity with CO2 as your, feeds, as your feedstock, you know, renewable sources of et ethanol could be nice, um, especially when we don't need to rely on corn to produce it. So that way we can mitigate this food versus fuel challenge of producing ethanol. Um, some other some other widely used chemicals can also be produced from CO2, but I'm going to be talking mostly today about carbon monoxide, which only takes two electrons uh, to uh, two electron transfers into CO2 to produce carbon monoxide. But carbon monoxide is a very important chemical intermediate used in the chemical sector, used in the in the petroleum sector. Um, so. I'm going to be talking a little bit about catalysts to produce those. And as I mentioned, the best catalysts for taking CO2 and converting it into carbon monoxide are gold and silver based. So they come with a bit of a price tag. But, you know, up until a few years ago, most studies involved different catalysts in their metallic form. And the question has started to come up, you know, what about, what about catalysts that are transition metals in some sort of ionic form or some sort of coordinated form? Is there a way to develop catalysts um, from these, the, the elements we have available in the periodic table that are not in their metallic state? And so now I'd just like to talk a little bit about a class of catalysts that, that I particularly find very interesting. And they're referred to as metal nitrogen carbon catalysts. And to your eye, they essentially just look like a pile of graphite. You could take your graphite pen, pencil, ground up that graphite into a powder. That is what these catalysts look like to us. But when you zoom into the atomic level, they have these transition metal ions coordinated to nitrogen dopants all within this, this graphitic structure. So it's a big graphitic particles with these transition metals sites coordinated with some sort of nitrogen dopant or nitrogen ligand. And uh, for any of you that work in the homogeneous catalysis space or molecular catalysis space, the, these species have, uh, these catalysts have an active site structure that's analogous or very similar to some molecular catalysts we see out in the world, for example, like an iron porphyrin or something along those lines. And the beautiful thing about these catalysts, these metal nitrogen carbon catalysts, is that they're prepared by, by fairly straightforward procedures. You can essentially take any source of a transition metal, any source of carbon, any source of nitrogen, blend them together and heat them up to about 900 degrees Celsius, and you're going to form uh, you're going to form these types of active sites in in that catalyst material, and ideally have some activity that comes with that. There's obviously a, a large degree of optimization and improvement that goes into these synthesis syntheses, but at the very basic level, they're relatively simple. And simple is nice because simple means cheap, and simple means scalable. So as I mentioned, these metal, transition metal nitrogen carbon catalysts have an active site structure that is analogous to homogeneous or molecular catalysts. And that comes with a few advantages. Um, for example, they can have very well-defined active site structures. And when you have a well-defined active site structure, generally your selectivity is, is fairly good because all of the active sites look the same or at least look similar and thereby favor the same product. Another big advantage of this is that you can achieve 100% metal utilization. When the, when the active site is in ionic form, that means there's just one transition metal site that's doing the catalysis. In the case of a nanoparticle, you're gonna have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of atoms all together in a nanoparticle. A lot of those are gonna be in the bulk of that nan nanoparticle and they're not gonna be available to do the catalysis. So you're essentially paying for metal atoms that are not doing any heavy lifting in terms of catalysis. 
with structures like this, in principle, every single one of your transition metal atoms that you're paying for and you're putting into your catalyst can be available to do the, the, cat, do the catalysis. So in principle, we can achieve 100% metal utilization. One of the downsides of homogeneous catalysis or, or molecular catalysis is oftentimes they require regeneration. So say, for example, um, the, the, the active transition metal ion is, is nickel two plus, for example. So once it does the whatever the reaction is we're looking at, oftentimes that nickel two plus is converted into nickel three plus. And then we need to go ahead and regenerate that nickel three plus back into nickel two plus. So we often have to have an electrode in that solution where the, the catalyst will absorb under the electrode, regenerate back to that nickel two plus state, and then go back into the solution, do its catalysis again, and then rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And then because these catalysts are in the same phase, like the liquid phase, for example, of the reactants and the products, oftentimes they require separation from the products at, at, the, at the end of the process. So those are a couple of the downsides of homogeneous catalyst catalysis. And you know, there's a lot of work done in that to overcome those challenges, but so I'm just broad strokes summary of these, these types of catalysts. Then on the heterogeneous catalyst uh, space, uh, so heterogeneous catalysts are catalysts that are in a different phase than the reactants. So for example, most heterogeneous catalysts are solids, whereby the reactant is either in the liquid or the gas phase. The nice thing about having solid catalysts is that they can be electronically conduct conductive and immobilized on your electrode. So essentially they have an infinite supply of electrons and therefore they do not require regeneration in the way that a homogeneous catalyst is. Because they're in a different phase than the reaction uh, reactants and the products, they don't require separations. But the, one of the issues is that um, because catalysis is a surface process, any of these uh, any of these catalyst atoms that are buried in the bulk are no longer available to do the catalysis. They're essentially covered by other atoms. So you have a, a relatively low utilization of the transition metal atoms in that in that catalyst. And oftentimes the transition metal atoms are your biggest source of cost. And that's the you know that's a long winded way of getting to one of the beautiful things about this type of metal nitrogen carbon catalyst is that they can combine several of the advantages of homogeneous catalysts and heterogeneous catalysts, where they they have active site structures very similar to what a homogeneous catalyst could have with the potential to have that hundred percent active site utilization, and all of these are immobilized on a conductive carbon support. So something like graphite, cheap, conductive, get your electrons in, get your electrons out, and then relatively stable. Graphite is a relatively stable material under electrochemical conditions, as long as you don't go to too oxidizing of conditions. But there are some challenges. There's some challenges in terms of the synthesis, in terms of characterize, so in terms of making sure that we, um, we form active sites that are structurally uniform, that have high surface concentrations, and then, um, you know, when we once we do that, it's really difficult to characterize these these atomically dispersed single atom active sites. There's not many characterization techniques out there that are really good for just looking at a single atom and telling us what that single atom looks like, what its coordination environment looks like, what the surrounding environment looks like. So characterizing these materials is is a challenge, and I'm going to be talking about that a little bit today. And then in terms of the meso and macro structure of these catalysts, we want to design these catalysts to have very good uh, transport properties. So high surface areas, high porosity, just allowing the reactants to get in and the products to get out. So there's a lot of optimization and, and design efforts that need to go into preparing these materials. Now, these are not... These are not a new class of materials. Um, they've actually been around in the, in the fuel cell literature for a little while. And actually iron nitrogen carbon catalysts are the best, currently the best non-platinum based catalysts for fuel cell applications, particularly the oxygen reduction that occurs at the cathode. There is no other non-platinum based catalyst that performs, or I should say non-platinum group metal catalyst that performs better than these iron nitrogen carbon catalysts that are prepared by relatively simple and relatively cheap processes. 
So these materials have been around for a while, but their Achilles heel right now is their is their stability under fuel cell operating conditions. They just they last a couple of cycles, you know, a couple of hours, but then they degrade. So that's the biggest reason that we're not seeing these these transition metal nitrogen carbon catalysts in commercial fuel cells, whereby commercial fuel cells are still relying on platinum and cobalt. But because these materials have shown so much promise and they've been around for a little bit for a little while, there's been a lot of excellent work done in terms of characterizing and understanding what the active site structures look like in these materials. Actually, I'm going to go way back to the early 2000s, back when I was in high school, and I would say this was the first compelling, and I should say I wasn't reading these papers or understanding any of these when I was in high school. This is when I was doing my PhD and I was reading previous literature. But going back to 2002, that was the first compelling study that really pointed to the presence of these iron nitrogen carbon sites in the catalyst. And this was done by a technique called time of flight secondary, secondary ion mass spectroscopy. And essentially what you do is you bombard a material, you collect all these ion fragments that are coming off it. And what these authors found is that they found they had these iron nitrogen carbon coordinated ion fragments coming off of their catalyst that they attributed to be from the active site structures in these materials. So that was the first, um, first compelling evidence of these species in these catalysts. And then there was an ongoing, a raging debate for 10, 15 years of, you know, is that actually the active site species present in these materials? Or is it, are the active site species just nitrogen dopants that just happen to be near iron, for example? But there's been a lot of follow-up work using techniques such as MOS power spectroscopy, um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy, and, and even uh, high-resolution uh, scanning transmission electron mic microscopy that have really painted the picture that, yes, we think it's these iron-nitrogen coordinated, uh, sorry, iron, iron ions coordinated to nitrogen dopants within a graphitic structure that are the active site structures in these materials. And I'll just highlight this one uh, stem uh, image up at the top here, where you can see these bright spots in the image. And what that bright spot means is that bright spot means that the atom being image has a higher Z number than the surrounding environment. And there's a lot of papers being published these days where they show an image like this, they circle this, this bright spot and they say, there's our active site. We know it's this particular metal coordinated to nitrogen, coordinated to carbon. You know, we've, we've figured it out. But the key problem with that, and I think many electron microscopists will tell you, is that any type of contamination, you could have just like iron ions from your beaker or silicon floating around that contaminate your sample that could give you these bright spots. So the key thing that needed to be done here was some sort of spectroscopic characterization to point and say, yes, this is an iron ion, this is an iron atom, and yes, there is nitrogen in the vicinity all within this graphitic framework. And this was really the first ever study that kind of conclusively painted that, that picture from a spectral microscopic standpoint. So I've talked about iron nitrogen carbon catalysts for fuel cell applications, but how about these metal nitrogen carbon catalysts for electrochemical CO2 conversion? And so, you know, big question was, you know, can the same type of catalyst be used for CO2 reduction? And the answer is yes. There was a couple of years ago, there was some very nice work doing a combined computational and experimental study that found that many of these transition metal nitrogen carbon catalysts could be very selective for the conversion of carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide. And the activity varied quite significantly based on the type of metal that was used to prepare these catalysts, because obviously the identity of that transition metal that's doing the catalysis is going to have a big impact on the activity and the selectivity of these materials. Going towards, you know, optimizing this, choosing, choosing one's metals wisely, uh, the field really moved towards the identification of nickel nitrogen carbon catalysts as being able to achieve almost nearly 100% selectivity for the conversion of CO2 into carbon monoxide. So when we're talking about selectivity, 100% sounds pretty good because that means every single atom, every single molecule of CO2 that's being converted is being converted into carbon monoxide, which in this case is the most desirable product. So that was really exciting. These nickel nitrogen carbon catalysts, relatively low cost preparation, relatively low cost materials going into them, had very good activity, very good selectivity for producing carbon monoxide. 
And this was activity that was comparable to state-of-the-art silver or gold-based catalysts, but at a fraction of the price. But there are still some open scientific questions that need to be answered. For example, what is the exact identity or identities of the active site structures present in these nickel nitrogen carbon catalysts? There's a lot of work done for iron nitrogen carbon catalysts, but you know, we, we weren't sure if those results were translatable to nickel. Maybe nickel is behaving very differently. And then the second question is, how can we maximize the surface concentration of these nickel active site structures um, and avoid the agglomeration of these nickel ions into metallic nickel, for example, that would not be beneficial for the reaction that we're, we're targeting. And ideally, we want to keep, we want to maximize the surface concentration of these nickel atoms, these nickel ions, I should say, because that's how we can, uh, we can maximize the catalytic activity and we can approach 100% transition metal utilization for the catalysis. Because once again, if we were to form metallic nickel particles, we're wasting a bunch of the nickel we're putting into the synthesis and it's not doing the catalysis that we want it to do. So I had the pleasure of working with a very clever PhD student, David Koshi, and he developed a, a method for uh, preparing these nickel nitrogen carbon catalysts in a, in a fairly clean way. He polymerized acrylonitrile in the presence of nickel salt, and he heated them up, first doing an oxidative heat treatment, followed by a pyrolysis at a high temperature in nitrogen. And he arrived at what he called these, these nickel nitrogen carbon nanoflowers. And what we found, and I should say what he found, um, when the, the concentration of nickel or the amount of nickel used during synthesis was very low, we did not see the formation of any nickel-based particles. But as we ramped up the amount of nickel that we were putting into during the catalyst synthesis, we saw a significant amount of, of these nanoparticles being formed. So you can see these big red blobs here. That's due to the presence of these nickel particles. Then we wanted to understand what effect the synthesis methods that were used and the properties of the catalyst had on the electrochemical CO2 reduction performance. And so we tested these catalysts in an electrochemical reactor that, that was home built and essentially looks like this, where we took the catalyst, we deposited it onto an electrode, we filled the reactor with 0.1 molar potassium bicarbonate, dissolved a bunch of CO2 in there, and started to do electrochemical CO2 reduction measurements. During these measurements, as the CO2 bubbled in and bubbled and, and flowed out of our cell, we sent that to a gas chromatograph so that we could uh, do product quantification, the product detection and quantification on the gas phase products that were produced. And then at the end of these experiments, we stopped the experiment, we opened the cell up and we collected the electrolyte to do NMR on to see if there were any liquid products present in there. So this is what a typical uh, GC spectra and a typical NMR spectra may look like where the GC detects things like methane, uh, ethylene, carbon monoxide, and NMR can detect things like ethanol, formic acid, acetaldehyde. I'm not going to talk too much about NMR because, as I mentioned, these nickel nitrogen carbon catalysts produce largely carbon monoxide, so a gas phase product. So pretty much everything that I'm going to be showing is from the, the GC analyses. And just quickly before we, we dive into some uh, catalyst performance evaluation, I just want to talk quickly about nomenclature. So you're going to see me talk about current density, which is essentially a quantitative gauge of the activity or the reaction rate of that catalyst towards a particular reaction. So high current density towards carbon monoxide means that the activity is very high for converting CO2 into carbon monoxide. And then Faradayic efficiency, that term is essentially a quantitative gauge of the reaction selectivity. So ideally, we want a Faradayic efficiency of 100%. That means that we have 100% selectivity converting CO2 into carbon monoxide. So what we found is that under, uh, under the range of electrochemical potentials that were investigated, um, you know, for example, between minus 0.7 volts versus the RG and minus 1.1 volts versus the RG, these catalysts were very selective towards pretty much exclusively carbon monoxide. So we had selectivities that were right around 100%. So this catalyst exclusively was producing carbon monoxide. But then as we started to go lower in electrochemical potential, 
um, they started to produce a little bit more hydrogen. So we found this kind of as our sweet spot of where this catalyst could be very selective for converting CO2 into carbon monoxide. Then we want to understand the impact of how much nickel we put in during the synthesis. So we started at very low nickel contents used during synthesis, and we systematically ramped that up all the way from about 0 .0 0 0.1 weight percent of nickel used during synthesis to about 8 weight percent used during synthesis. And what we found is that when we, when we steadily increased the amount of nickel that was used during synthesis, we increased the activity for converting CO2 into carbon monoxide up until a point. And at that point, we saw a plateau. It was, it we no longer had a, a, a benefit from putting more nickel into those catalysts. So we want to figure out why. And essentially what we found is that when the concentration of nickel used during synthesis was relatively low, we did not see the formation of nickel particles, whether that's metallic nickel, nickel oxide, None of, those, none of those particles were forming, which meant our, our nickel content was below some sort of threshold value after which nucleation and growth of these, these particles would occur. But what was interesting was that even for the, the high, the, the catalyst that had a lot of nickel in there, the selectivity was also still fairly good towards carbon monoxide, even though we saw the formation of these nickel particles. And nickels actually, um, under CO2 reduction conditions, is much more selective towards reducing water into hydrogen. So we would have thought, you know, our, our catalytic selectivity would go way down when we had these nickel particles present in the catalyst, and we didn't see that. And the reason we didn't see that is because what would happen is these nickel particles would form, but nickel, uh, metallic nickel particles are actually a good catalyst for the graphitization of various carbon materials. So what happened is these nickel particles would form and then they catalyzed the growth of this graphitic shell around them. And what that graphitic shell did is it essentially blocked the surface of those nickel particles from doing any catalysis under CO2 reduction conditions. Um, David was very diligent, did a bunch of X-ray absorption spectroscopy measurements. And, you know, I, I realize this just looks like a bunch of squiggles on a slide, but ultimately the end result of these, res of these experiments was that these catalysts seem to have structures in them that looked somewhat along the lines of this nickel phallocyan cyanide molecule that I show down in, in the bottom left here that had a nickel ion in the two plus state coordinated with these pyrrolic nitrogens within this kind of graphitic looking macrostructure. But David wasn't quite satisfied. So what he did is he took these materials to Oak Ridge National Laboratory where they had some very nice electron microscopy facilities and he did scanning transmission electron microscopy measurements with, um, with related uh, EELS spectroscopy. And he saw these bright spots that said, okay, you've got these, these higher Z number atoms present in your materials. But then he also did the, the correlated spectroscopy to figure out what the identity of those atoms was. And what he did find is he found that those atoms were largely nickel coordinated to nitrogen within this graphitic structure. He also did some time of flight, secondary ion mass spectroscopy measurements when he was at Oak Ridge National Lab. And essentially all of that, once again, pointed towards the presence of this nickel phallocyanine like structure in these materials. And so, you know, we've got a picture that's, you know, we're, we're starting to paint a picture of what the active site structures in these materials look like with a lot of advanced characterization. But then the next question is, you know, what is the spatial distribution of these active site structures? Some of the techniques that I showed you, for example, X-ray absorption spectroscopy or time of flight secondary ion mass spectroscopy are bulk techniques. So we're essentially getting bulk average information. We're scanning millions and millions of particles. And it's just saying, okay, you know, the, it looks like these structures are present in these materials, but we don't know where they are. Maybe there's one particle in there that has a concentrated amount of these particular sites that we're, we're characterizing, but it's not uniformly distributed across the catalyst. Or the other measurements that can be done, for example, transmission electron microscopy, provide very localized measurements. So you're looking at one single catalyst particle among millions. And you know, even within that, you're looking at about, I can even go back, you're looking at an area of about you know, four nanometers squared. 
of your catalyst material. So you don't get an idea of what the, what the meso or the macro structure is of these catalysts or what type of active site structures they have and where those active site structures are located. So what we really need is we need techniques that can provide spectroscopic insight with spatial resolution. So right when I started McMaster, I coerced Adam Hitchcock out of retirement um, because he truly is one of the world leading experts in a technique called soft transmission X-ray microscopy. So a technique that I'll call Stixum because that's just a mouthful. So Stixum means soft transmission X-ray microscopy. We have a co-advised student, Chen Yang Zhang, who's been leading a lot of these efforts on using Stixum to understand these nickel nitrogen carbon catalysts. So essentially what Stixum does is it provides a microscopic image of a catalyst particle, something that you might expect from a transmission electron microscope, for example. But every single pixel on this image is a correlated uh, X-ray absorption spectra that gives us information into the chemical structure that is present at each one of those pixels. So what we can do is we can take a Stixum image, we can integrate the XAS spectra collected in the different regions, and that can give us insight into what types of structures are present in these materials and where they are present. So as an entry point to using this technique to understand these catalysts, we've prepared some of them by just mixing together nickel chloride, cyanamide, polyaniline, um, and ammonium persulfate to make some materials that we could hopefully uh, allow us to understand these materials with spatial, spatial resolved information. And so I'm not going to dive too much into the details here, but essentially what we found is that these, these catalysts, you know, as, as I showed a little bit before, they consist of two particular, particularly distinct regions. One of those regions is what we call particles, you know, so you can see these very dark spots that are, I, that are likely nickel-based particles. So in this case, it could be metallic nickel, nickel sulfide, or nickel oxide. And then these carbon matrix regions that just kind of look like graphitic carbon. So what we did is we separated the catalyst into those two distinct regions, the particles and the carbonaceous matrix, and we integrated the, the, uh, the spectra that we collected from that. And so the, the results of those spectra are shown on the, on the left here. This kind of pinkish red color is the spectra that's collected for the particles. And this green is the spectra that was collected for this carbonaceous matrix. And what we did is once we had those spectra, we compared those spectra to some reference compounds that we had. One of those reference compounds was metallic nickel. We also used a nickel phallocyanine-like molecule, and that's what David Cochi's work kind of pointed towards being a likely active site structure in these materials. We had some commercial nickel sulfide we collected as a reference spectra, and then a, a nickel TPP molecule, which I showed down here on the bottom right of the structure. And so what we found that was very interesting is first off, not the biggest surprise, the particles were found to be metallic nickel with, uh, with a bunch of nickel sulfide in and around them. But the really interesting thing is that these carbon matrix regions, everywhere that we looked at these carbon matrix regions, they had these nickel-like species present within them with a spectra that most closely resolved uh, the nickel TPP structure. So this kind of painted a slightly different picture from what I showed previously, where the nickel phallocyanine, you know, it, it had the, these active site structures seem to have um, properties somewhat similar to those, but properties that or structures that more closely resembled this nickel TPP like structure. The other thing that we notice is that when you look at these reference compounds, the nickel TPP uh, uh, peak is actually quite narrow because obviously, you know, it's structurally homogeneous. But in terms of the active site structures or these, these coordinated nickel structures we saw in our carbonaceous materials, that peak was quite, quite broad, which tells us that we have some distribution in the exact identity and structure of the active site materials uh, present in these catalysts. We correlated these results with, um, we correlated this characterization with results of electrochemical CO2 conversion and ultimately what we arrived at without diving too much into the details is that these catalysts consisted of these nickel TPP like structures all within this carbonaceous matrix that were very good at converting CO2 into carbon monoxide and those particles consisting of nickel metallic nickel or nickel sulfide some of them were blocked by carbonaceous layers but some of them were exposed and those ones that were exposed were actually more selective towards producing hydrogen. So the more of those we had in there, 
the, the less selective our catalyst was towards carbon monoxide. So this was just a nice way to get this spatial distribution, so to get this insight into the types of active site structures present in these catalysts and figuring out exactly where they are present. And then that brings us to, you know, arguably the most exciting question of all, and that is what is the identity and the properties of the active site structures in these materials under reaction conditions? So all the characterization that's been done thus far and that I showed thus far is essentially just on as prepared materials or on materials after they've been tested for their catalysis performance. But the, the structure and properties of a catalyst as prepared may not be anywhere close to what the structure and properties are of a catalyst under reaction conditions. And we want to know what those active site structures look like under reaction conditions. And really the only way to get there is to develop and implement in situ or operando characterization approaches to provide us this level of understanding, which is gonna be crucial for achieving a fundamental understanding of how these catalysts behave, and then using that understanding to design new and improved catalysts. And so long story short, um, we're working on it. Uh, Adam Hitchcock has a former PhD, or sorry, former postdoc, Professor Martin Obst, who's at the University of Beirut, and he's got a very talented PhD student, Pablo Igno, who has designed this microfluidic electrochemical reactor that interfaces with this microchip electrochemical reactor that has a working electrode where we can deposit our catalyst. We can flow our electrolyte in and we can run electrochemical potential measurements or, or electrochemical reactions in a Stixum chamber. And so essentially in action, this is what it looks like. We just take this, this device, we insert it into the Stixum chamber over a Canadian light source, and we can do some in situ measurements on electrochemical CO2 reduction catalysts under electrochemical CO2 reduction conditions. And so as a proof of concept, Chun Yang, Adam, and friends have worked very hard on the, the first the first thing to do was, okay, making sure that we can achieve electrochemical CO2 reduction conditions and actually look at a catalyst. And so we use electro-deposited copper as our, our, as our entry point for doing these measurements. So Chun Yang electro-deposited copper onto these electrodes and then did some characterization, essentially took uh, Stixum spectroscopic measurements to figure out what types of copper were, pres were present in these materials. And what he found is that when you start flowing an electrolyte into the system, you have a bunch of metallic copper, copper one plus oxide and copper two plus oxide present. And then we wanna apply electrochemical bias or electrochemical potentials, such as those that would be seen under electrochemical conditions. And what we found is that we could track the morphology as well as the oxidation state of copper under these electrochemical conditions. And so really the next stage of this research is to implement these techniques to understand these nickel nitrogen carbon catalysts, what their structure is, what their properties and what their morphologies are like under electrochemical CO2 conditions. See, so I'm getting late on time. Quick shout out for the CCM. We do a lot of work there. You know, super fortunate to have those facilities available at McMaster. And Ahmed Abdella is also a PhD student in my group working on in situ characterization of electrochemical CO2 reduction catalysts using electron microscopy. So essentially taking these microchip reactors that have a working electrode, a counter electrode and a reference electrode, depositing a catalyst on, onto that working electrode, um, flowing in an electrolyte, achieving electrochemical CO2 reduction conditions, and then characterizing the, the phase structure of the catalyst under CO2 reduction conditions, as well as the morphological changes occurring in this catalyst under electrochemical CO2 reduction conditions. So this work is uh, almost fully baked now. We're hoping to submit this paper in the next couple of months. And so that just highlights some of the in-situ efforts that we have ongoing here at McMaster. With that said, I'd just like to highlight a few of the areas that our group works in. I highlighted them at the beginning of the slide, so there's no sense to go through again. And then the last thing I want to highlight is that it was almost three years ago to the date that I gave a BAMR seminar right after I started McMaster. And I said, you know, what are my plans? What are our plans now that we started McMaster? And here's a picture of our lab. It is completely empty of equipment, of humans. So I said at this BAMR seminar, our goal is to equip this lab with equipment, fill it up with brilliant young graduate students to, who want to do exciting research. And then, you know, 
in, the, in those early months, we got our first few graduate students in the door. We started setting up equipment up until the point that we're at today, where here we are. We are operating. Our lab is looks very used. Sometimes maybe looks a little bit too used, but very used and uh, a really busy team of graduate students, undergraduate students and postdoctoral researchers doing some very nice work. And, you know, I, I, I owe a lot of gratitude to the students. Like I said, they keep the lab running. They're doing all the hard part, that experimental research in the lab every day, working hard and thinking about the, the important research topics that they're addressing. So with that said, um, big acknowledgement to the, to the entire group. Uh, pro obviously, Professor Adam Hitchcock has played a huge role in a lot of the work that was shown today. Um, and his PhD student, Haytham, and our co-advised student, Chun Young. Thanks to the entire group, all the folks from Stanford who contributed to the work that I showed, and then our, our funding agencies and the facilities that support this research, including the CCM and the Canadian Light Source. So thank you all so much for your attention. I'm sorry, I went way closer to three than I, I, I aim to finish at 250. I got a little excited and went a little bit long, but there's my email, there's our website. Feel free to reach out to me, feel free to check out our website, and I'm happy to chat about this at any point. Thank you. Thanks very much, Drew. That's great. <clears throat> um, the floor is open for questions for Drew. Uh, we are uh, short on time, but we have time for a couple of quick questions. Stephen, please go ahead. Hi, Drew. Uh, a really neat talk. Um, I'm just curious about the spatial resolution gap between, say, the TEM and the Stixum work you have been doing. For the in situ stuff, are you starting to look at tychography to try to span that gap? Yeah, absolutely. I think every time I talk to Adam Hitchcock, he, he drops the word tychography at least eight or nine times. Um, so yes, absolutely. <laughs> that's the that's the next step that we're we're very interested in working on. And um, so that's going to be coming down the pipeline very soon. And I'm sure you'll see us kicking around CLS a little bit and um, doing those measurements because that you're absolutely right. That's a, the way that we can really increase the spatial resolution of these measurements. And I think there's a real opportunity to develop techniques and implement them in that space. And actually, Adam and I have a co-advised postdoc who's going to be starting next month who has some experience um, with these with these measurements. So I think he's really going to spearhead those efforts. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, good question. Thank you for that. Drew, I have a question. Um, you showed some really beautiful work with uh, metals on carbon scaffolds, uh, but in most cases, those scaffolds are pretty ill-defined, right? They're more like, I don't know, graphitic, amorphous carbon, things like this. Is there any value to having more well-defined nanostructured carbon um, supports or scaffolds for the metals within these uh, catalysts? Uh, so that's a that's a really good question. Um, so from a fundamental standpoint, yes, like the more well defined we can get, the more insight we can get into the structure and properties and performance of these materials. But achieving that, you know, when we're pyrolyzing these materials at 900 degrees Celsius with a bunch of nitrogen in there, a bunch of transition metals in there, achieving that is very, very difficult to do. And so, um, Yes, it would be very interesting if we could achieve that, but in, in reality, um, every single one of these types of catalysts I've seen is very heterogeneous in terms of structure, particularly of that carbon backbone and all of the, the species that are present within it. Are you thinking something like carbon nanotubes, for example? Carbon nanotubes, that... graphene, maybe reduced graphene has been doped with nitrogen species, something like this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. People have tried that, and I think that even with those better defined carbon backbones, it's still fairly heterogeneously structured. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's true. That's true. It's, it's not easy to control these things. Um, along similar lines, you mentioned that a lot of the catalytic sites kind of resemble thalocyanines, let's say, or, or these porphyrin type structures. So does that mean that 
thalassines on their own are good catalysts for CO2 reduction? That's an, that's an excellent question. And the answer is yes and no. Um, interestingly, I haven't seen too much, you know, there's not a whole lot of work that's been done on that, but there's been some work on cobalt thalassinine, which can be fairly fairly selective for converting CO2 into carbon monoxide. So essentially taking like a cobalt thalassinine and immobilizing it on a carbon nanotube support hmm. through some sort of like covalent linkage. I forget all the details. You you would you would understand that much better than I would. Um, so yes, there's been there's been some work in that domain. Um, one of the issues is the stability. The the thalassinine molecules seem to reduce from having the ionic metal ion into like metallic particles over time which we don't see as much in these types of catalysts, but um, those are a very nice model system that have been well studied and do have some promise for sure. Okay. okay. Any other questions for Drew? Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions. So I'd like everyone to join me in uh, thanking Drew for an excellent seminar. Uh, one more time, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all next week for another uh, seminar along similar lines. Thank you, Alex. Thank you all.